Uh, yeah, if I my thing is if I need a T-shirt or if I need a medal to remember that I did the thing or to remember the experience, it must not have been that good of an experience. Like I will never forget about Western States. Like even if I never run it again, even if I never run another mile in my life, like it it really was. It lived up to the hype. Not a lot of things live up to the hype in my book, but at Western States did. What's up, everybody, and welcome to episode 115 of the On The Runs podcast. We are still on our break, our summertime break, but we had to come back real quick to talk about a couple badass women. One of them is my badass co-star of a podcast host, Six Star Erica. What's up? <laughs> How you doing, man? You're sounding a little, a little scratchy. What's going Last on with you? Last week. Last mm. week I was so much worse. I had no voice. I didn't even I couldn't even project anything. But I'm getting better. It just sucks I got sick during our summer break. Because if mm-hmm. I got sick during actual podcasting, I could have just called in a sub. Maybe someone like Michaela Shrimshock. Michaela, what's up? Welcome <laughs> back to the pod. Hey, glad to be here. It's nice to be a returning guest on on the runs. You guys have improved the quality of this podcast so much over the. I mean, not that it was ever bad, but now I listen into episodes and I'm like, oh, this is a professional recording. Yeah, we're big oh. time now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, it it was bad. It was, but it was <laughs> great at the same time. You're episode like 22, maybe 26. You're in there. You're in their 20s there. Mm-hmm. We, that's when we almost we weren't rolling weekly yet, but we were so close to doing it. And yeah, if you go back, so people who listened last week to the our OTR classics, they heard episode five, which was bad. And they heard episode <laughs> yours, 22 or 26, whatever it was. I think it was 26. So they heard yours. Uh-huh. And I re-listened to that, right? When to to play for the classic, but also to refresh my mind about what we're gonna talk about today, which I fully forgot everything. It was bad. It was bad, but it was so cool to listen to it and hear how things have happened. So thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. Like last I time, did. didn't we use, we must have used Facebook Messenger or were, were we on the phone? Was it phone or Facebook at the I time? I think it was Facebook, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I, yeah, I have no clue, honestly. <laughs> it was it was a, an adventure. We were learning, figure a lot of things out, but now we're on YouTube. So I hope you did your hair and your makeup. <laughs> And you got everything ready. Brush your teeth. Erica has got some spinach in her teeth right there. She didn't floss, of course, but we... (laughs) I don't need spinach. No, I'm just kidding. We're here to talk about the two big ultra marathons the two of you did just last week. But real quick, Michaela, let's get like the 122nd rundown. What's up with you? What's new? What's changed? No, I've been good. I've switched jobs a bunch of times, right? Like after, right after I found out I was getting into Western States, I found out I was getting a new job. So I had a whole bunch to learn. I had a whole bunch of training to do. Mm. Um, I've been just traveling around the world, running and living a great life. I've been watching you and I think that's so cool. (laughs) Didn't uh, one of the ones that I saw you just did, you just did comrades, right? And was that South Africa? Yeah, that was my second comrade. So if you do it your first two years in a row, you get another special medal back to back. So that's now one of my favorite races, one of my favorite countries. Very cool. How how easy is it to get into that one or is it very difficult? Because that was a bucket list for me. Yeah, you do have to have a qualifying marathon, but it's like five or five and a half hours compared to like three and a half hours is my Boston qualifying time. So very nice. You don't. You no longer work with me, or at least at least at the same company. We never really worked together, but that's how we met. Yeah. You you left, or actually, sad news. I don't think you left. I think you were one of <laughs> uh, very a lot who got who got uh, as, let go. We, as most of those too. things happen, it was not uh, expected, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Of course. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. Good. I I don't remember when we had you on, but I have moved on to same company. Everything else has changed, though. I'm no longer where I used to be. I'm even in a different building, different state, different everything. You still and have some very adorable children. I do. <laughs> Did you see their haircuts? Did you haircuts? No, I didn't see the haircut. Oh, they really look like me now when I was their age. So, yeah, it's uh, they are. They're hopefully being good downstairs right now. What was I thinking scheduling this on a Sunday night at 7 p.m.? I was wondering that, too. I was like, this is very off-brand. 
Yes. Usually it's like nine o'clock on a Sunday. Yes, night. usually it's nine p.m. I don't I don't know what I was doing. But oh, I would have declined that invite for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's I don't not think take, I could have stayed awake. <laughs> well, let's not take too long, but let's get into Western states. Michaela, if if we remember right on your last episode, you were you kept getting lottery tickets. You would get them through all these races. You even did like a trifecta race, like three ultras and three weekends, and that got you like three tickets, or three lottery tickets. You were never gonna you were never getting into Western states. But then last December, when you were in Millinocket, Maine, hanging out with our friend Lindsay, yes. we realized the two of you were there together doing a Millinocket marathon. While you're running in the marathon, they called your name. Yeah. Usually I'm uh, volunteering at a race on that weekend. And so I'm always like watching or, you know, watching the wait list. But this year I kind of like completely forgot about it. I was probably at least one or two handles into Fireball on the Millinocket course um, yeah um, and then I went to that bar that's right there at the finish line the blue ox and checked my phone and my phone was like blowing up all these people were like you're in you're in I was like what is what is happening right now uh yeah so that's how I found out that I was finally in for western states December 2nd or 3rd uh of last year and I was like I'm too hung over right now to even process a training plan <laughs> Now, Erica, Holy do you remember you posted on your stories like, congratulations, Michaela? And I was like, she's running a marathon right now. And you're like, oh, my God, did I ruin the surprise? I know. I felt kind of bad because we were just talking earlier about, like, watch parties for these kind of things. And I was actually glued to my phone. I was very invested because I myself had one ticket in there. Yep. And I was like, for lo the love of God, please do not choose me. I'm not ready. <laughs> so I got my wish. I did not make it in. But in in between all of that, they chose you. And I was so excited for you. I'm like, oh, we know her. She finally Even got in. They pronounced my name correctly. Yeah, <laughs> that exactly. yeah they did. But I, I don't yeah, think I've ever gotten it wrong since your episode, by the way. I'm pretty good oh, at I it now. Shrem shock. <laughs> But yeah, we, we saw you and I was like, ah, so I sent a message and it posted whatever. And then I, he said that I was like, oh no, I don't want to be the one to like ruin the surprise. Like how else is she going to know? Like, I don't know. Yeah, no, that so was I, was worried for I don't know if you were the but... first one or not, but yeah, I didn't even have my phone with me probably when I was running. And so, yeah, I wouldn't have. Yeah. But it was great to finish and then have that as a surprise. Like, oh, just keep training. <laughs> There's no now, slowing down. Right. Now, well, why don't you explain to me, how do they pick? The names i was it like a bunch of lottery tickets and a hat or was it like a spinny thing it's and they pull a ball out with your number how do they do it's it like the bingo like have you ever been to a church bingo with the tumbler wheel no <laughs> exactly what she's talking about i yeah. love bingo who's not been to it around bingo. I, I think maybe in the 90s the grandparents did that maybe uh, okay well i've been required to go to them on numerous <laughs> Well, and that, it's, it's probably the, the form of entertainment you have in West Virginia. It's bingo yeah, night. Well, actually, Pittsburgh, it was where I always thought of it as. But yeah, that too. So yeah, it's this big tumble wheel. And I don't know who prints out all the names or and everything and puts them in there, but somebody does. And so then Erica, they print sponsors to pull out the name. So like, okay. you're not drowned. Like, the one guy isn't just saying names for four hours. <laughs> okay. So Erica, you had one lottery ticket. How many did you have, Michaela? Uh, I think it was 32. So you get. And they two. rolled over. Well, they didn't used to roll over, right? So if you didn't run a qualifier one year, you lost all your lottery tickets. Oh. So, like, everybody that was in the lottery, like, you know, most people get in by like the time they have 164 tickets, which I think is 10 years or something. Um, so it's two to the n minus one, where n is the number of years you've been in the lottery. Uh, yeah, so all those people that have been in there for a really long time have run like a really hard race. Like they're not all 100s, but they're all really hard, like 100 Ks or longer uh, for that many years in a row. So that's why it's such a like so many good long term ultra runners end up at the race. But now they're letting you roll over your tickets. So nobody knows what's going to happen to the lottery. <laughs> so explain to me, if you had 30 something lottery tickets, is your name in that spinny wheel 30 something times? Yeah. So. Like if your name got pulled again, do they just say, okay, she's already in, I'm getting, okay. Yeah, so and that happens chance, too. There's a chance they call your name like 30 something times. That happens. I mean, not 30 times, but people's names do get called twice and they'll be like, oh, well, that person's already in. And now last lottery question, <laughs> because you got in this year, 
if you want to go again next year via the lottery, do you start back at zero? Yeah. Well, you Western States is a qualifier for itself. So I'll have one lottery ticket to enter this fall in November. So, I mean, and since they roll over, there's no reason not to, I feel like. But I'll be I know what you're in for like, if you get like, to do it again. Yeah, I'm not. I don't want to get pulled next year. That's for sure. <laughs> you need <laughs> but there are people that Western States ends up being their first 100 miler. So, like, if you qualify with a 100K or 70 miler and it's your first year or even your second or whatever year, you may never have done a 100 miler before. And I would be scared shitless. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, even having like now I have two under my belt, I'm still terrified. I don't know if I will go f- like put my name in again for, <laughs> for a nickname, ticket. I'm terrified. My nickname has always been fearless because like I just don't ever like comprehend fear and I was so scared of this race. <laughs> that just goes to show you then how badass it actually is. Yeah, I, I think you have the right level of fear, Erica. I don't want to dissuade you from doing it, but you have the right level of fear. <laughs> I might get you to crew me or something if I do ever get in. I'll be like, she knows what she knows what to do. I'll be there. All right, fearless. Real quick, tell me, <laughs> how much fear do you have in your face when our friend Lindsay popped in front of you at the Mill Locket Marathon? <laughs> oh my god, hi! I know you. You don't know me, but hi. And she's wearing some elf costume or something, and covered in glitter from head to toe. Too. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you had to be scared. <laughs> I think I had had enough good coffee that morning that I wasn't like terrified and I had kind of <laughs> seen this green glow approaching from the side. It was all glittery and sparkly and green. I was like, oh, there's a thing coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think when I realized the two of you were there, I like instantly started a group chat and it's like, you two need to meet. <laughs> that is, yeah. No, it was so great to see her. And I, yeah, she helped me out with like where to go and stuff because there's not a lot of direction for that race. Yeah. That's her, that's her race. She, she loves goes, like it. every year. Yeah. It's, it's a really lovely race. I mean, it's super expensive, right? Domestic travel is so expensive. The race entry is free, but then there's like the 5K the night before, and then they ask for a donation, and then you have to go to the Elks Lodge. And yeah, it was yeah. a super expensive yeah. week. Well, I mean, it's away from the most the economy. Hey, free race. You come here, you're going to spend your money here. You I know? did the gimmick. Yeah, I was there for it. Yeah. I needed a yeah. marathon in Maine, and that fit the bill. So there you Perfect. go. There yeah. you go. All right. All right, but enough jibber jabber there about our friends and everything. Western states, you finally got in. You told us about the lottery. Let's get all the details logistically and everything. When did you head down? Where did you stay? Did you get like uh, used to the elevation there? You're near Tahoe, I think. And or were you just like you showed up and you ran? Would you give us the details? Yeah. So um, the one good thing that I will tell everybody about, and I really think they should do it, the on Memorial Day weekend, the Western States Endurance Round organization puts on a training camp and you can sign up for one, two or all three days of the weekend. You don't have to be entered in the race to go like you just pay your money and go. And it's not cheap, but, you know, it's it's a nice thing. And you do like 70 miles of the course over the three days. So you don't do the very first part from the start to Robinson Flats, but you cover everything else. They don't have all the aid stations, but enough aid stations are there that, you know, you're fine with just a regular pack. And it's the same aid station captains that are there on race day. So it gives you an idea of like who's going to be where and what kind of stuff's going to be at the aid station. They bust you to the start and finish. It was fantastic. If I had not done that, there's no way I would have finished this race. I might have even been too scared to even go to the race. Um, but it was just nice to be in like a low stress. Like some people run it really hard. The elites come, they're at the front doing their thing. The rest of us are just back there, like eating our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and chit chatting the whole day. (laughs) Um, so yeah, so that was really great way to like, just put down some good vibes on the trail, see what everything looks like in the daylight, get, try to remember the names of like the landmarks and the climbs and the aid stations. But I'm not like such a good planner, especially with travel because I travel so much for work all the time. And it's always like, two days before I book a hotel, a week before I book a flight, you know, like, Mm -hmm. I'm just not good at like real travel planning for myself. And so I don't know, I I did book flights a while ago. And I was looking at them the week before and I had scheduled myself to fly into Sacramento, that's the closest airport uh, at like 11pm on Thursday night, before the race. Oh. It's still like an hour and a half drive up to Auburn, which is like the nearest city. And then it's like an hour and a half drive from there up to Tahoe where packet pickup is. 
<laughs> and so I had a panic attack on like Tuesday that week. And I was like, this is such a terrible flight, Michaela. Why did you do that? So I hurried up and changed my flight to a direct flight that got me in at 8 p.m. So that at least made me feel better. better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so then I drove up to Auburn, went up to packet pickup on Friday and I was doing this um, like a scientific research study they were doing on women ultra runners. So I had to be there at a certain time to get a DEXA scan for my bone density. Um, and so I was running late and there was traffic on 80, you know, it was just a whole thing, of course. And you had to like pick up your race bib by 1 PM. And I was like cutting it close for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was fine. And it was probably good for me. Cause I didn't want to get like, I'm kind of the same way with serious marathon expos too. Like I just, I want to go, I want to get to the bib pickup and then like, just let me leave. Don't make me go to all these vendors. I don't want to touch anything. I don't want to breathe anybody's air. <laughs> Like, no. And so it was, you know, it's a big party atmosphere. I mean, it's in a ski village. All these crews and pacers are there. You know, it, it really is like the Olympics or something of, for ultra running. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was good that I was running late and I was super stressed because I couldn't get involved with any of that. Um, I forgot to bring it up here. But yeah, one of the organizations, too, they made us all like starter trophies. They were just like they had your name and it had your bib number engraved on this wooden plaque. And it wasn't like a finisher's thing. It said, enjoy the journey. Like you made it to the oh. start line. And I thought that was so epic. I was just like, they even fit my last name on it to <laughs> everything. That was a really different thing. Like I've never heard of that before, but that that's really special. Yeah, so I had an either. Yeah. And you know, for Western, it really is, right? So many people, and they brought this up at the pre-race briefing. And I thought it was going to be a lot more focused on like the elites and stuff but they brought it up many times like how hard it is for people to get into this race and what a journey it is you know I mean you live a whole lifetime waiting to get into this race or more right you might have changed Mm -hmm. jobs you might have moved countries changed partners you know whatever like people go through a lot to get to that start line um and so yeah I just thought it was a really nice thing to have as recognition so yeah so then I have all this cool swag And um, I was telling Erica about it, like 10 days before the race, my SI joint on my hips just like twisted completely out of place, like a crunched soda can. Um, It was probably like the flight back from South Africa. And then I was crawling around in my crawl space, fixing some plumbing. And yeah, like I couldn't move for 36 hours, basically, because my hips were in so much pain. (laughs) So even like you know, and I wasn't going to drop out of the race at this point. I'm like, well, I might as well at least go to the start line, make it to Robinson Flats, because that's where the training runs had started from. So I'll see that part of the course. But I was in so much pain, like I couldn't sit to make it through the flight even over there. Like I had an ice pack, I had these belts, I had all these like things on me. Um, And so I really didn't know how it was going to go. But then I had all this cool gear from Packet Pickup. They gave you like a Hoka backpack and the Hoka slides. And you've got this little trophy thing already. And I was like, Oh, I really got to make it to the finish line now. Um, So I go to drop off my drop bags. You had to drop them off on Friday, which is always great, right? Like that's one less thing to worry about once your drop bags are out of your hands. Mm -hmm. No more decisions have to be made. And I couldn't find the one for the river crossing, Rucky Chucky. And that's where everybody wants to leave their shoes, you know, to change after they're wet. So I asked this woman and, you know, I'm just like a little ball of anxiety. Like I think people can just see me coming a mile away. And I'm nearing the cutoff when I have to drop off the drop bags. And I said, where's the Rucky Chucky? I thought there was going to be a Rucky Chucky. And she's like, calm down, honey, calm down. You just can't see it because everybody has their drop bags there. Everybody wants to change their shoes at Rucky Chucky. Where are you from? Is this your first Western States? How could you know? I gave it away. (laughs) So then she walked with me to like each one, made sure I got my drop bags in the right place. And I'm very anal about how they're labeled I print them up on a printer and then I put them inside of FedEx labels and that is um taped to the bag so like there's no way people have to worry about reading my name there's my phone number on there like Mm -hmm. I just have a whole system so she helped me put all my drop bags in the right place and I said oh that's a really pretty belt that you're wearing um and she's like oh that's nice yeah I got it at like some arts and crafts fair you know I just traded my hat to some lady who liked it do you want this belt And I was like, well, Western States buckle would look nice on it. She's like, well, I'll be at the finish anyway. I'm the Green Gate aid captain, aid station captain. So I'll come meet you at the finish. And I was like, are you serious? (laughs) And so later on, like during the pre-race briefing, she came and said, well, you know, do you just want it now? And I was like, oh, no, 
Absolutely not. Like there are so many obstacles in my way between here and Auburn. Like I need that belt as motivation. I need your generosity and kindness as motivation to get me there. So I didn't really like think any more of it. And she was the aid station captain at the aid station after Rucky Chucky. And she's like, Michaela, how are you doing? And it's like two o'clock in the morning, you know, you know, yeah. you know what you're doing at mile 80 of an aid state of a hundred miler. And she's like, oh, you're going to finish. You're going to make it to Auburn girl. And I'm going to see you there. And then I know I'm putting the cart before the horse. I'm telling this whole story wrong, but um, like with the mile to go in the race, she her and her runner friend John came and met me and they ran like the uphill the last little uphill with me they ran me into the track it was so sweet and then she gave me my belt so now I have a really good belt to put this belt buckle on and I love that it's like a very girly belt like it's flowers and it's purple and it's not just like a I was admiring it. It's gorgeous because yeah. I don't have like a belt to display any of mine yet. I need to do some some work. Well, but I mean, that has an amazing story attached to it. For the belt to come to you sometimes. Yeah. I think I think that's. The point. <laughs> yeah. So, Michaela, what kind of stuff did you put in your different drop bags, and how many drop areas were there? Because if you said you had like shoes in the one right after a water crossing, and then like, yeah, I'm curious to see how many you got. I don't know that I've ever done an ultra with so many drop bag options and it was terrifying for me. Uh, You know, usually I'd like there to be like one drop bag, not quite in the middle, but like at mile 55 or 60 or something, you know, like halfway in terms of time, or I like there to be three, you know, so I can break it up into three chunks, but there was, there was just so many drop bag options. I was overwhelmed with the choices. And then since I'm a solo runner, like I don't have crew or pacers, I actually try to put my drop bags where, like that chaos is not going to be right. Mm -hmm. So if there's a aid station where there's no crew allowed, but I can't have a drop bag, that's a definite one. Um, I like to change my shoes a lot, uh, probably more than most people do. There was actually one place where I probably could have put an extra change of shoes that I just didn't realize how wet it was going to be at that first 30 miles, but it worked out. Okay. So I had a drop bag with change of shoes at like 43 um, it must've been last chance. And then I had a change of shoes at Rucky Chucky. So I changed my shoes twice okay. um, during that. And they were very different shoes. Like I had carbon fiber plates. I had like lots of trail feel and then some like nice, cushy, pretty Hilmas. Do you know about Hilmas from? I do uh, know about Hilmas, but yeah. you can tell me all you want about them. <laughs> Happy to hear. Well, they were my last pair. Cause I knew like, they don't do so well whenever they get wet, but they're like super comfy. And mine are like the ones I have now are purple. Um, mm. and they're just very cushy and comfy and they make me happy. So, so that's the pair you need when your feet are dying and they hurt and you just need something nice and comfy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Although I will say all, all of my shoes now are still sitting outside cause they are just covered in red dust. Oh. Uh, if you've ever, did you ever do like Grand Canyon hiking or like rim to rim to rim? It's the same no. thing. Like not only are those shoes trashed, but like any socks that you ever put inside of those shoes again are also <laughs> trashed. <laughs> Fair enough. That's just, it's like glitter. Like you can never really get rid of glitter. Yeah. yeah. And then obviously I put a bunch of food in my drop bags. Um, I put an aid, like a little first aid kit and at least a couple of them, Mm -hmm. you know, first aid for me is usually just a safety pin to pop blisters. So I usually have plenty of safety pins. My feet did. Did you have like the safety pin trick you told us about when you were on last time? Wasn't that you? You were the one I think who said you always carry a safety pin to pop blisters right i'm curious i mean my like vest and my running clothes are all covered in safety pins because you can like fix so much with a safety pin right yeah i think that was you yeah i don't know that it was but (laughs) i don't know if we paid attention to the classic last week (laughs) he's making shit up okay Uh, somebody talked about that before yeah i mean you just i mean every runner that i know already has safety pins like in every cup holder in your car do you not have five safety pins right now (laughs) <laughs> and then in my purse and the glove compartment <laughs> yep yep everywhere well and I judge a race too by the quality of their safety pin because sometimes they give you those like really bendy ones that are oh, bendier than a paper clip and you're like dude I do not trust the flagging on this course at all <laughs> <laughs> western states had perfect safety pins they were super resilient super sturdy yeah they were great <laughs> point western states here we go yeah You'd think in 51 years, they'd figure a few things out. Yeah, they nailed the safety pin. They know what they're doing. They know what Uh they're doing by now. Well, let's go to the starting line. Race day morning. This is the world's oldest 100-mile trail race. 
what was the vibe like? You've seen videos of these starting lines before uh, at, at all these ultras around the world. What was the vibe like at Western States? I think everybody was crying. I mean, they might not have been like <laughs> tears streaming down their face, but I think everybody, regardless, was just like taking in the emotion of the moment. I mean, it's it's really a pretty small race, honestly, right? Like there's only 300 runners there. You know, there's a few more crew, but it's five o'clock in the morning. So, you know, a lot of the crew is not there. So it's wives, it's husbands, you know, it's the really dedicated people there to see their runner off. And, you know, for some people, this has been a lifetime in the making, or they've been coming back from some huge struggle or, you know, what just whatever is going on to get you to the start line of any race, but just amped up a million times for this mm-hmm. one. Um, and the clock is, has been going there since the day before. So a lot of people come and see it during packet pickup and then see what happens later on. Um, yeah, I mean, I was definitely teary eyed. And then you have this climb, like you can see the climb from the start line. So you know what kind of <laughs> headache is in store for you, <laughs> the breathing problems. So you're just like, I'm not going to get choked up. I'm not going to get choked up. <gasps> oh! <laughs> Um, yeah, but it was, I would say, pretty much the same as any ultra. Like, there's not a lot of, like, jumping up and down and screaming and chanting like there is at, like, a marathon or something. Uh, <laughs> now I always sing Shoshaloza to myself in the back of my head at the start of almost any race because the start line of comrades is, like, indescribable. I mean, unless you've spent a lot of time at a rave, I don't think you could possibly comprehend the start of comrades, but... Yeah, so I, I have a mini version of that going on in my head now at the start of races. Very nice. So it looks like I'm looking at your strap look. You definitely climbed over 2,000 feet in those first uh, 3.8 miles or so. And at one point, you had a grade of over 25%. Yeah, it's it's a nasty climb at the start. Holy and I was shit. like still just worried about how my hips were gonna do. So I was taking it really slow. And you know, like there's some people, there's some fans out already, you know, like cheering people on somberly, you know, I would say as excited as you can be at five AM with only one right. or two for coffee. <laughs> um and yeah you're climbing up basically the ski lift right so like you're yeah. going up to where the chairlift drops off and I hope she doesn't mind me saying this but this adorable woman from Calgary she and I were climbing together and you know like you go right where like a quad chairlift is like I mean it's a big thing you can't miss a chairlift and you've been mm-hmm. walking up it this whole morning and she walked right into the damn thing <laughs> oh no! That's focus right there. You are so focused on getting up that you just tunnel vision and don't see. Blood started gushing out of her nose. Oh my how, god! How oh, fast she was really she moving? It. I mean, hiking, right? Like slow. Yeah. If it if it smacks you dead in the face, like any anything, like you could just be like. Poof. Well, she you was know, good natured about it because I instantly started making fun of her. Of course, <laughs> she she put up with it. Oh, yeah, but she didn't end up finishing, so I don't know. DNF by chairlift. That's really early in the race to have, like, something dinged on you, you know? Like, that's just, is this how my day is going to go? Like, is this what I have to look forward to? Exactly, yeah. I think it was probably more the emotional sting than the physical, but yeah. That's Well, those things are usually, you know, surrounded by these huge, puffy pads for the skiers but they're on the other side as you're hiking up skiers aren't going up that way you don't need right. to worry about them skiing in, into it going uphill so yeah no pad either yeah oh, that had yeah. to hurt that had to suck you yeah. said there's about 300 something runners yeah i'm just reading here as i'm on the website for 300 something runners this is impressive they have over 1500 volunteers yeah that's three to one yeah volunteer. that's amazing yeah I don't know how they get so many people to come and volunteer and like for some really long times, like the people that stand in the water at R- Rocky Chucky to help you across, they do 90 minute shifts. I mean, they are wow. in wetsuits, but like they are standing there helping. I mean, crazy ultra runners. We are crazy to begin with a mile 77. We're not any saner. And they're helping them get across the river all night long. That's a lot. That is. Yeah. So what kind of, is that like a current, like, is it a strong river crossing that you guys have to deal with? 
Yeah, so there's a dam right up the river. And so it's kind of up to like the Corps of Engineer, whoever operates it, what the flow is going to be that day. I mean, they know the race is going on. The race director requests that they drop it. But, you know, sometimes they just can't or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, this year was exceptionally low. I think this is one of the lowest water levels the river crossing's ever been. If it's really high, they do rafts. So, like, then everybody has to wait on the bank and then they raft them all across and then they come back. Um yeah, but it was so low, we had the option of wearing the PFD. But I mean, it's still like the water level still came up to like chest height on me. So I mean, it was like you were wow. in the water. Wow. Yeah. Um, and they're like, oh, make sure all your electronics and like your waist lamp and your um, headlamp and stuff are out of the water. And I'm like, well, I, I only have two hands. And they're like, make sure you have two hands for you to hold onto the rope. What do you want me to do? Strap it yeah. to my head? Like... So I just like hung as much stuff as I could around my neck. And I was like, oh, I don't know. We'll figure this out on the other side. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this is coming down into from the the first side you get to. Mm -hmm. And like you can see this aid station too from like three miles away. <laughs> I'm so glad you found that picture. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can see this aid station from like three miles away and they have a boat. Um, you know, like whenever you go rafting and there's like the guide that carries your lunch and your coolers and all that, like one of those kind of big boats. Mm -hmm. um and he's sitting upstream to just make sure nobody drowns and then they probably have I don't know like seven or nine people in the water to like just keep you moving across basically and so they're, they're holding the rope taut too there's a I mean my mom said she was watching the video and some guy did get swept downstream like they had to go get him oh no um, I mean it seemed like you like your feet would have to be pretty mangled for that to like because I mean you know the rocks are slick but they're not that bad yeah. and a lot of them that's the only thing to be careful is like you know like I said the water was up to my chest maybe um uh, but then like some of the rocks also come up to near the level of the surface so like you'll just be shimmying along and then you know the, the guides would warn you like oh there's an ankle buster there or shin buster or something so then you have yeah. to kind of step around the rock uh, but it's so well lit down there I mean it's lit up broader than daylight as you can see so yeah uh, yeah, this rope, though, is tricky because it's not as tight. Like, it was a different thickness than the other rope. And so I was expecting it to give the same amount. And so I was like, ah! <laughs> but it felt so nice to just be in the water. It was so nice and cool. It really never cooled down at all, even at night during that race. So you had some warm weather. Was it, was it like, did you have any threat of rain at all? Or was it just hot all weekend? just hot all week. And I mean, it wasn't even the hottest that they've ever had. Like it was a pretty typical year. The worst was once you got like into Auburn or even after the race in Auburn, it was like 109 degrees. Oh, wow. I am not built for that. And you can tell me it's a dry heat all you want to. I don't give a damn. I it's felt still like a hot. Yeah. I felt like I was a rotisserie chicken. Like it was mm. miserable. And like afterwards they had shade tents, you know, set up, but then all the runners just pack in together. And it was just like a big pile of rats in the shade. <laughs> like that's not any cooler. <laughs> oh, no, but the body heat is worse. I, then like, it's sweaty and it stinks too. And yeah, so yeah. You're, you're not getting anything good. I've never been that great with heat, but then whenever I started doing those winter ultras, I got so much less of a tolerance for it. I just, like, I can't function everything. Like, I don't want anything to touch me. I get so cranky with people. And so I think I got a little bit like heat exhaustion or heat stroke or something the first day, like during Saturday. And like, you know, I try to put on sunscreen, but my shoulders were all rubbed raw and stuff. Um, and so then that night it really hit me and I was just like dehydrated. Like by the time I got to Rocky Chucky, I was dehydrated and nothing would sit in my stomach. You know, the goos I've been using for like three years that never fail me were just curdling in my stomach. Oh no. Um, yeah. So it was just one of those kind of nights, but that's usually what the heat does to me. So what did you have to do to pivot to get your electrolytes back up? Uh, I waited three days. <laughs> Not the answer I was looking for. But oh, holy shit. Yeah. No, no, no. That's that's tough. Like if you can't like, well, I mean, you finished the race, which was good. But like you, what your body must have been so rebellious of that. <laughs> like if yeah, it you was not happy, you couldn't get it back in. Yeah, no, he was unhappy with me. Um, I did. I started using exogenous ketones, this training block, too. And I think that really helped because at least I was okay. getting like some sort of fuel in. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my body just, it, once it was done, it was done. I ate a lot of strawberries. The strawberries in California are so good. Mm -hmm. um, 
Did you run Big Sur? Did you I did, that? yes. Yeah. That was the one thing. Like, they give you these giant strawberries near the end. Like, twenty mile 21 or 22, you're like, give me all you can give me. Yeah. <laughs> those are fantastic. So they yeah. have them there. That's great. Yeah, they had lots of them there. And so, yeah, I was just like, it, I looked down one time, and one hand, all the fingers were blue. And one hand, all the fingers were red. And I was like, what is going on? Then I realized this was my Blackberry hand, and this was my strawberry hand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, but for some reason, fresh fruit during an ultra is so good. I love watermelon during these kind of races. Even I know you can like put extra salt on it, but I will house an entire watermelon if you give it to me. Like it just hits so good during yeah. these races, especially if it's hot out. Yeah. I'm a potato girl. I definitely ate all their potatoes that they had out. I would rank the aid stations. The the um Robertson Robinson Flats, they had the best bacon on the course. He was Ooh. making bacon, which was delicious. Uh, some of the bacon was a little subpar, you know. Um, <laughs> eh, they can't all be winners, but that's awesome that that's something that they offered to you. Yeah, they imagine how good that would be. My two go tos. Once it gets towards the end of the race, like mile eighty, I, it's a free for all. Like anything that I want to put in my stomach, I'll put in. But there wasn't. Mm -hmm that I wanted to put in at that point so right yeah so for this race um just thinking about mine and I I had some bathroom issues just where I had to constantly have to pee and that's I can't it. imagine that's, that's not a, it's probably not a good thing but um during your race I can't imagine they had porta potties everywhere so were you were you just like searching for bushes here and there like was it your typical trail race where anything goes I don't even know. I I don't. I never looked for a porta potty. <laughs> well, that's good if you didn't need one. Oh no! I guess that's not true. That's not true. At uh, Michigan Bluffs Aid Station, I did use that porta potty. Yeah, because I was worried about my hips. Um, and I I commented that their porta potty they did not have good toilet paper. I will say oh, that. Oh no. Um, but other than that, yeah, no, the porta potty situation. I guess they had them. I don't know. I'm a squatter for sure. I enjoy that like mid race break, you know, like later in the race, I try to do it near a tree. So in case I need help getting back up, this is a great right. time to have the poles with you. <laughs> yes. Like, yep. You're not allowed to use poles at Western States. So that was a no go. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. I'm, Even up the mountains and stuff? I'm sure. Yeah, you're not allowed to use any kind of assistive thing. Oh. The blind <laughs> guy was allowed to use poles. There was a blind runner that finished the course. Uh, he was allowed to use poles. <laughs> oh my gosh, I think I saw his finish. Didn't he finish like just over the cutoff or something? Oh, that, that broke my heart. <laughs> broke everyone's heart. And everybody's like, give him a buckle. And I was like, I mean, you can ask him, but I guarantee you he does not want that buckle. Staring at a buckle you didn't earn. I mean, totally. he's accomplished so much, right? Like, I think he was the second blind runner to even attempt the course and the first to like complete it. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, take that, come back again, do it better. Exactly. No, I'm I'm on the same page, but it was just hard. You're like 30 seconds. Oh my God. Like, uh I yeah, I feel that. But yeah. wow. Okay. So I I uh will need a lot of work if I ever need to <laughs> if I ever do Western States, because my last two hundreds have used the poles and I felt like I've needed them just because I can't stand up straight. <laughs> so so that's good. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. See, so, I mean, yeah, I think a lot of people use them for most of their ultras. So yeah, just train one. I mean, they are that. kind of a crutch if, if you're literally <laughs> leaning on them, but if, if you need to do that, <laughs> I guess it's kind of like, I, well, I don't want to say raw dog, <laughs> but it is. They're kind of a double-edged sword, at least for me, because like a lot of times I won't eat that or I won't drink, you know, because I have these things in my hand. So they're, you know, they're another th complication, right? Mm -hmm. that you have figure out like what am I going to do with them whenever I do need to eat That's true. am I still going to be able to eat right like I like to eat usually on the climbs or just before the climbs or something so yeah um, yeah all right Michaela before we get to the other details of the race and the finish I want you to tell me as I'm looking at you Strava what was your why you wrote remember your why <laughs> yeah I wrote that as a joke because I never have a why <laughs> <laughs> You know, this is like whenever people are like, oh, yeah, what's your life's purpose? What's your goal in life? Like, I'm just here to live life. It doesn't have to be complicated. And I mean, I no disrespect to people that have whys, right? Like for their mom, for their, 
you know, aunt for their cancer treatment, for their children, for their, you know, whatever their why is. I totally respect that. That is not why I go out in the woods and run a whole bunch of miles with weirdos. Um, I do it because I love running a bunch of miles in the woods with weirdos. <laughs> That's a perfectly <laughs> acceptable why. Yeah. Um, you know, I there have been a lot of people that I've run with recently that I feel like treat ultras especially, but any kind of running is like a punishment for themselves. You know, like mm. they're out there not because they enjoy the running or maybe they enjoy the people or the community or something, but they just get through the running because, you know, it's a punishment or, you know, it's a, they can have a reward after that or something. Mm. Um, and again, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, that's, that's their personal choice. But for me, it's never that like, that is always my reward at the end of the day. Like I'm not a morning runner. I'm a night runner. Cause like, if I can make it through the whole day, then I know that I can go on my run in the evening and everything will be okay. If I had a really stressful week at work and I get to go climb mountains for a weekend, like all the better. Um, when I was describing my travel schedule for like May and June to somebody, they were like, Oh my God, that just sounds like so much. That's so chaotic and stuff. And I was like, I get to do this. Like, I mean, yeah, of course it's chaotic and of course it's stressful, but like, this is, I'm so lucky to have these opportunities and to be able to just pick up and go run a hundred miles in the woods or 20 miles or whatever it is. Like, yeah, no, that to me is my why. I think it's really special too, that you enjoy doing those long distances. Cause a lot of people don't, it's very difficult. And I mean, you're not choosing the, like easy stuff either. I know you, you have difficult stuff that you like to do. And I just think that's really, it is a special thing that you genuinely enjoy doing that stuff, whether it's just, just being in the mountains or just going for a run. It's, it's awesome. Why do you collect all the feathers then? I always collect feathers. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. Even whenever I'm like out on the river paddling or something, if I happen to see a feather, it's got to be in my hair. <laughs> Someday I'm going to end up with bird lice and I'm going to regret this. But... <laughs> it's for a good story, though. <laughs> yeah, I know you're supposed to be like the take nothing, leave nothing kind of thing. So I try not to take all of them. But yeah, I, I collected a couple blue jay feathers. So you, you take those and stick them in your hair? Yeah, into my little poop knot in the back of my head. <laughs> what do you call it? A poop knot? <laughs> Erica knows what a poop knot is. <laughs> it's just like a button. Like but... what you call it a poop knot. Do you well, like you must you must roll like uh twist your hair and it looks like a little <laughs> Yeah, I mean you put it up, but like in the back, like it doesn't look pretty. Like you don't do anything with it. It's just like what women do with their hair when they're ready to get shit done. <laughs> All right. In this photo, uh -huh. do you paint your toenails dark? No, no, they have been I always choosing a, a toenail color for a race is a thing like that is part of the pre-race ritual um this color is sturdy sapphire because i wanted it to be blue because blue is my favorite color but all the colors that i was finding were like i don't know they were just like baby blue or something and it had to be like a strong blue color so that is sturdy okay. sapphire the so it's not to disguise the disgusting toenails or the bloody feet and all that <laughs> this was Okay. It's a pre-race ritual, Eric. Did you not just hear me? Of course there's nothing disgusting about my toenails underneath. Not you. Not you, ultra runners. <laughs> um, no, my left big toenail will probably have to be, well, is going to disappear at some point because it's almost never actually attached to my toe. And then the one right next to it, this race, got a little messed up and a little blistery. But other than that, like, there's nothing wrong with my feet. Like, I didn't, I had one little teeny tiny blister. Like, I couldn't even pop it. It was so tiny. People okay. were at the finish line, like with these bandaged Franken feet. I was like, what happened to you? What did you do? I sent Erica a video today of a guy after running like an ultra taking his sock off. I'm like, Erica, we need to do this for the pod. And we Erica was like, real fast. <laughs> no way. I'm like, what if we do it? But then the sock comes off, we blur the feet out. It's like too <laughs> disgusting for even the pod. I've seen some face pictures that I want blurred out. I do not want that image seared in my brain anymore. Well, I'm assuming these ones are safe because you posted them. So this one My here... feet never look like that. What was that? My feet never look like that. Even at the worst race ever, my feet have never looked that disgusting. So this is at race start. So you can see that mountain in the background. That's where yeah, we... That's the one you had to climb there? <laughs> it's just looming in oh, the background. Oh, you got the West Virginia... That's like your West Virginia t-shirt on. Yeah. It is, yeah. Every single West Virginia runner finished. Yay! Yeah. 
Shout out WV. <laughs> and I have this belt on. You can't, it doesn't show up as well in that picture, but there's like this belt to hold my SI joint together and all of these. So this looks like a video. Well, it's a quick pre-second video, but here you are. Oh, that's you know, gorgeous. Blogging to your followers, of course. And yeah. All sense. I said was holy fucking shit balls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel that. I feel that. That is so incredibly gorgeous. What mile of, was this at? Two. <laughs> <laughs> two. Mile two, you know, 2145. This is 530 ish, right? Because sunrise is oh, there. So, yeah, it was very early on. This is after Michigan Bluffs because I changed shirt. That shirt did not last very long. It was starting to be evening and i was like oh good it's gonna cool down now i can put on like a t-shirt um and it did not cool down at all it was miserable i will really say hot. my friend sarah who's done this race before and her husband was doing it again this year she told me to take an extra bottle like just like a ginger ale bottle a propel gatorade bottle like a crappy bottle mm -hmm. and use it just to like fill up at, at creek crossings or like at the aid stations to dump water on myself Okay. And that thing was a game changer because I have like the ice buff or like the bandana and stuff. But the yeah. problem I have with those is then they like drip down my body into yeah. my socks, right? Like they just end up, you end up with water everywhere you don't want it. But with the bottle, you could really target it onto just like your face and shoulders. Mm -hmm. But right before this picture, I dropped it off. Like I threw it away because I was like, oh, it's going to be evening time. I don't need that anymore. You can see the feather <laughs> in this photo. I'm just noticing it. You have the feather in your poop knot. <laughs> that was right perfect behind your ear. That was perfect usage. <laughs> and now, do you have a headphone? Are those headphones, or is I what probably is... do have headphones. Yeah. For so for what... some races, they have a solo division, which is no pacers, no crew, and no headphones. Western states doesn't do that, so I was allowed to use headphones. What were you listening to besides the On the Runs podcast and the On the Runs playlist? It's, tacos. <laughs> <laughs> it's raining tacos. Oh yeah. <laughs> that is On always repeat. fun song that i suggest for people yeah i don't uh, know i don't know how often you listen but sometimes when and i might edit it out on other times but sometimes when you say what song do you want i go in raining tacos has already been taken <laughs> <laughs> i actually think i put it in the show notes more than than anything else it's just like make a song fyi raining tacos has been taken <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's fun, fun. It is really fun to get that song stuck in your head or other people's song that stuck in other people's heads. Um, that climb, one of the big climbs is called Devil's Thumb. And like, I don't mind it because it has switchbacks, first of all, which is fine. It's single tracks. So you're like in the woods. Like, it's really pretty. Those, those, that picture before this was on a road. Like, who wants to do a climb on a dirt road in the heat? Like, that wasn't fun. But yeah, so Devil's Thumb, I would always sing to people, this is the climb that doesn't end. Yes, it goes on and on, my friend. Uh -huh. it's, it's, fitting. <laughs> it's fitting, for sure. Yeah. You, uh, you definitely could... represented West Virginia. You even got on the necklace there. Oh, wait. Is no, that South that's, Africa? That's South Africa. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm not sure how good your geography is. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a quick, quick like. look. Yeah. All right, here we talked about this was the river crossing. Mm -hmm. Hopefully this will be on YouTube, everyone. If not, I'll just put a quick section on. We'll see how everyone's videos sync. Uh, so there was a live stream. I'm guessing someone snagged a screenshot of you on the live stream here. Yeah, my friend Alicia, her husband, Donald, was running, was crewing for a West Virginia guy. And she's like our instagram west virginia ambassador she is just like if there's something cool on instagram she will repost it um but she and her friends had a big watch party for all of like the runners from our area and so she snagged a bunch of these and sent them to me the day after so, this was at 128 in the morning uh -huh. it's actually 428 in the morning where she is in west virginia yes she pulled an all-nighter <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think so. Like, there were a lot of people that I know that were having watch parties, like, all night long. Because, I mean, you know, like, I was at the river crossing, but other runners were finishing, right? Or, you know, getting closer to the finish. So it's fun if you have, like, at least six people, I think, scattered across the time. Yeah. This is That's called cool. No Hand Bridge. This is a famous bridge on the course. Everybody knows it. If you didn't know it before you ran Western States, you know it after. Um, I don't know. My dad said there were, like, 30 countries uh wow. represented 
at Western States this year. So yeah, they put up all the flags for the different countries. That's cool. And then, oh, we can get to this after. I got questions about your buckle and other medals, but here's the finish line. Since we're at the photo of the finish line, why don't you give us the rest of the race? Fill us in with all the details, how it went. Was there any any moments of like disaster or like, I won't get it, or the, the woman who gave you the belt, like, you're going to do it. You're going to get the buckle. Give us the rest of the details and bring us to the finish line here. I mean, I feel really bad because the rest of the race was just like, I mean, I don't want to say boring, but it was just like such a nice ultra running experience. Like I love running at night. So like I was excited for the night. Um, so after I made it to Forest Hill, that's where day one of the training camp ended. And I'm sorry, I keep referencing the training camp, but for me, that's really how I like broke up the race, like the pre-race training camp part that I had to finish. And then day one, day two and day three. Um, but yeah, so once I made it to Forest Hill, there's a huge downhill out of Forest Hill. It's like almost a three mile drop. And I love downhills. Um, and I knew I'd have the trail myself. I could just put on my headlamps, my waist lamps, put on a little reggaeton and just do my thing. <laughs> um, and so that's pretty much what I did. Uh, and it was it was just delightful. I didn't see a ton of wild animals. I saw a bunch of deer. I saw a really pretty frog, some lizards. Um, yeah, but I know some other people saw some cooler animals uh, or hints of them, or they thought they did. <laughs> Hallucinations, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was really tired. A rock. Yeah, definitely. I was really tired all day, so I was surprised that I didn't have more hallucinations, um, but I really didn't have anything exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, my stomach got a little messed up because I was a little dehydrated. You know, I just sort of forced myself to drink some water, forced myself to eat some more salt, kind of just got through it. Um, the sun came up, which I was bummed about, you know, my A goal was 24 hours with the injury. I had a feeling that wasn't going to happen. So I had like uh, set a B goal of 27 hours. Um, and even that didn't happen. So then it's just sort of like, oh, well, we'll get to, you're good to buckle. It'll be fine. Um, but yeah, I just kind of enjoyed the rest of the day. There's still a lot of climbing, right? It's a net downhill race, but there's a lot of climbing. And even at the very end, I made so much fun of this. One of the last aid stations, he's like, all right, well, you're going to go down this downhill and then you're gonna have this really gentle grade up to Roby Point. And I guess he thought I was gonna be too delirious to pay attention to him or something, but like that little gentle grade up to Roby Point is this like two mile climb on pavement up to the, like, it's just a miserable climb. Um, and I would call him out on it. I was like, that is bullshit, dude. I was here for the training camp. There's no gradual anything <laughs> here on this be like at mile 47 and 48? No, no, this is at mile like 90, 95. Oh, okay. I'm going to it. I'm all I'm all on your Strava. I am digging into your Strava. Well, mile 90 was a descend of 163 feet. So Yeah, but then there's a the big climb up to Roby Point. I found it. I found okay. it. Man, you crushed it. Um yeah, so the, I mean that it's not a bad part. The problem with it is like that's a like a social trail, like a public area that people come like are wandering with their coolers and they're like smoking cigarettes. Like they're just doing normal stuff yeah. that humans do on a Sunday. And so whenever <laughs> they see you, you can't be like walking or dragging a bum leg behind you. Like you have to look like you enjoy running. <laughs> I mean, like you're happy to be there. Mile 100 for you. You had almost 600 feet of climbing. In oh, fact, the last mile? Almost 800 feet in the last two miles. Oh, yeah. Had, it climbed right up to the very end, basically. Yeah, mile, I think it was 48, was 894 feet of climbing. That was that devil's thumb. That might be devil's thumb. Yeah. Yeah, you crushed it, though. You crushed it. <laughs> but Your honestly, first... like, for a West Coast race, I think the climbing feels a lot like East Coast climbing. Like you're always going up or down. There really aren't that many just like ridiculously long grinding climbs that never end. And that's what I tend to think of as like a Western race. Well, those right? those like, first four miles, mile one, 623 feet, mile two, 770, mile three, 576. And now four, oh, you got it right. 207 feet of climbing. <laughs> you're like, you're hopped up on adrenaline. You're talking to everybody around yeah. you. Like, yeah, that's a, you can't count that as a climb. <laughs> this was impressive, Michaela. Absolutely impressive. Some more Strava stats. Elapsed time, 27 hours, 58 minutes and 18 seconds. Moving time, 26, 15, 50. An average pace. Erica, do you want to guess? 
her average pace per mile. We usually don't talk about paces. We're not about fast runners, but I, this is impressive. I'm Go ahead so and like, excited and pumped. Now take a guess. I'll even give you just the minute range. 16. Yes. 16. The only reason I know it is because her time is very close to what I finished in, and I know my. Oh, you cheated! You so, cheated! Hey, you you set me up. Total for it, elevation amazing. seventeen thousand four hundred ninety three feet. You burned over ten thousand calories. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. So impressive. <laughs> after burning all those calories. What did you have for a post-race meal? <laughs> yeah, so I don't know how you are, but especially after hot races, like I want to eat all the things, right? Like if I was at a restaurant, I would order a burger and a milkshake and breakfast burrito. Like I would order everything. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. It, like they had breakfast foods there at the finish line whenever I finished. And like, I just don't do a lot of breakfast foods in general. Like pancakes weren't doing it for me. Uh, and I was about ready to pass out because I was so dehydrated and low salt. So I can't like, and I already am pretty prone to passing out. So I tried not to stand up. I was just sort of like crawling or <laughs> hovering. <Yeah. laughs> but I was just dumping like salt packets mixed with a little bit of scrambled eggs in my mouth. <laughs> Um, and then some Coke, right? Some ginger ale, Coke, all that kind of stuff always tastes really good. One of my guilty pleasures that I do put in my drop bags is tonic water. And I know that sounds gross without gin to a lot of people, but it's just the Not right. Really. It's sugary sugar, and it's got the fizzy. Yeah. I and when your that. mouth is like, you know, that ultra mouth where it's just like coated in, I don't know, carbohydrates or something, it will cut mm-hmm. through that. And it's something like a flavor that I actually want. Um, the next day I was super excited to have waffles at the, you know, hotel waffles are just like, I don't know what they're made out of crack cocaine or something. <laughs> but I made myself one and you know, I ate maybe, I don't, I didn't even eat a whole quarter of it. I ate it like a half of a quarter. So an eighth of the waffle. And then, yeah, I could only eat in like hundred calorie bursts for a long time. Yeah. 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 It takes so long for your body to just get back to normal. Like, I think, so what I had after mine, it took me a good like six hours before I could have a real meal, but I had a slice of pizza and I was like, pizza, yes. And then I was like, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> like one slice of pizza. Usually I could scarf like a half of a pizza and it just, it takes so long to just feel good again. Just right. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that was my same experience. And it usually is. Like I said, the colder races, it'll be easier to come back from. But the hot races, it's like my stomach is just done. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I know we touched upon your goals for this race. And you said like your your A goal didn't quite work out. Your B goal didn't quite work out, but you finished, which was great. Was there any point in the race that you were worried about making cutoffs? Like, I don't know how strict those were at all. The cutoffs are really wonky, actually. Um, yeah, because, I mean, I wasn't actually that far off from the cutoffs at some of the aid stations. Mm-hmm. But the aid stations, I think the cutoffs are pretty lax in the first part, and then they get really tight towards the end. Like, there's something weird about them. But I even told this to one of the racers, because I came through, uh, it must have been Devil's Summer, Michigan Bluffs, and I was only, like, an hour off from the 30-hour cutoff. But according to my pace chart that I had made for myself, um, I was only like an hour off from my 24 goal time, you know? So like that, my pace chart was adjusted to know like, Oh, I don't climb very well. I descend very well. I'm fine in the dark. I don't do well in the heat. Right. Like it took a lot more of that into, into consideration. Um, so it was kind of weird that like, I, I generally don't, pay attention to cutoffs, right? Like if I'm at the point where I'm paying attention to cutoffs, I'm probably going to DNF because I can't handle that stress. I don't want to be that close to the cutoff. Right. Yeah. I get that. Right. But I mean, there were some people like around me, I think that were paying attention to it and it's pretty clearly posted at all the aid stations when you come in and when you leave. The other thing about me versus other ultra runners is I don't spend a lot of time at the aid stations. Mm -hmm. Like obviously if I drop, if I have a drop bag and I'm changing clothes or shoes, that's like 15, 20 minutes. But if I don't have anything to do, like everything that I need to do at an aid station, almost all that I can do while I'm walking. Right. So I'm grabbing the strawberries. I'll grab the, get my handhelds filled up, Mm -hmm. but then, you know, I get them adjusted, put them in my pack all while I'm walking. I don't care if I'm not running, but at least I'm moving forward and I'm not being distracted by stuff that's going on at an aid station. Yeah. So I think that's a easier way to get out of the aid station on time too. 
That is good. I I did notice like, so you said you, you do a lot of these races on your own. You don't have a crew. That is one thing that I found during my first hundred that really held me back because, um, so my boyfriend would crew for me and he met me at like one end. So this was only 33 miles in. And I felt like I had to spend time with him because he was bored. He was all by himself. Like I, so I spent probably a good half an hour there when I could have been out 10 minutes be, like earlier or 20 minutes earlier. And it's like almost a guilt thing where these people travel so far to be with you and help you. And you're like, Hey, I don't need you. I'm going to keep going. And <laughs> so it is like a, I don't know, it's a give and take kind of thing, but yeah, if you're especially hard for women runners, right? Like I think a lot of male, and that's a gender five, but you know, I think a lot of male runners can just like come into their aid station, do what they need and walk out mid sentence. And like, <laughs> True. for me, it was the same thing because I've had crew before and it was just too stressful. Like I told them I was going to be there between this time and this time. And I'm like, way too early or way too late. Like, oh my right. God, I'm gonna be mad. They're not having so a good factors. time. Like I need to arrange entertainment, let alone a, a race like Western States where you have to fly them out there. Like, <sighs> I couldn't imagine the stress. Well, well, recently, Erica and I learned something new, a new term. And Michaela, I'm going to give it to you here. DFFA. Yes. Don't fiddle <laughs> fuck around. <laughs> One of our new friends, Amy, um, she has that tattooed on her. She's got DFFA for don't fiddle fuck around. I've and... never heard it as an acronym, but yeah, that was the fiddle fart around. Yeah, that was a big <laughs> <laughs> however you want to put it i think it's amazing it it really does tell you hey you have a mission to do right do not waste this time it is precious and you will regret it later have you ever volunteered at a hundred miler no i have not yet you I should would, though that. that's where you will learn a lot of these tricks because this is i volunteer at cno canal 100 here in harper's ferry and that is my whole job and i'm known as like I, people call me horrible names during the race because i will come and like literally dump them out of their chair or i will set timers on them i'll be like you have two minutes to get out of the same station not because they're close to cutoff just because they've been fiddle fucking around for 20 minutes yeah no, that's actually really good that you do that. And yeah. if if you were doing it to me, I would say thank you because you wouldn't I, at the time you would cuss me out and that's fine. I've got broad yeah, shoulders. Probably. But at the end, whenever you have a buckle, you'll yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Because it's such if if you sit down and I know they say beware the chair. If you sit down for too long, your legs are gonna seize up. You're not gonna you're gonna lose motivation real quick. And right. you need you need people, volunteers like yourself who are going to do that and risk being called a bitch or whatever. Like <laughs> some, somebody's going to get mad at you, but you are doing them a service. So exactly. thank you for what you do. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Boot them in the ass. Yeah, get out of here. <laughs> well, cool. I don't know where we are because I missed the last 10 minutes. I asked a couple extra questions, but I mean, Michaela, is there anything else that you'd like to, to close out your epic Western States? Race? No. <laughs> Well, let me ask you this question then. I asked you what the vibes were like at the starting line. What were the finish line vibes? Death and destruction. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I was in no physical or mental condition to take in at all the finish line, which is kind of a bummer. Um, it was 109 degrees in, in like a track, right? You're, in a, you're on a track and field track. So there's no shade. Like, it's not like there's trees. You're not like at a park or anything. Um... Yeah, it was, it was not fun. Um, they did have like showers, but again, like I couldn't even stand up for very long. Uh, I definitely, whenever Erica runs Western States, I'm going to go and be her crew. Yes. I'm going to go to the pre-race brief, the pre-race area, and I'm going to party for like two or three days straight. I'm going to do, there's this high camp challenge where you run up that escarpment thing the day before. Some, some Western States runners actually did that too. I'm going to be at the finish line partying my ass off the whole day. Yeah, I'm going to do the whole experience. But as a runner, I like, no. I will say, when you cross the finish line, they give you a medal. Like, they hang a medal around your neck. And, like, luckily I was too feeble, but I really just wanted to punch that guy in the gut. I was like, I don't want your goddamn medal. I want my buckle. Where's, Where's my, my buckle? buckle? Where is it? um and like in my head I'm running because you know they there's something in the pre-race briefing like well they don't give you your buckle right away because they have to make sure there's no complaints against you that you didn't violate any of the rules right and I'm like oh. who cares if I violated rules I'm here in 28 hours um but the reason they do that is because they engrave your name on the back of the buckle they engrave oh. your name and everything so every finisher gets their name spelled correctly engraved on the back of the buckle so you don't get it That's right cool. away 
So you can't like go, like you can't go home. You can't go to your hotel. You have to be there for the 1 PM, like award ceremony. And then they present you with your buckle. And so like my hotel was pretty close. So I probably could have, but I was afraid once I'd see a bed and air conditioning. And like, I just didn't want to be separated from my buckle anymore. Like, <laughs> so and yeah. That, that that brings us to when you were on here last and everyone just heard on the classic, you weren't really into metals. And you might have said there, now nah, you didn't really care about buckles either. So what's your take on this buckle? I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say anything out loud. <laughs> it's being recorded. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, wait, I have it here. Yeah, it's, it's pretty. I mean, my one friend, I posted a picture of myself wearing it, and he's like, well, it would be better if it was silver. And I was like, thank you, buddy. <laughs> Because <laughs> silver is under under twenty four. Yeah, that's right. So, so you're under thirty. Miles, so you got the bronze. One hundred miles in one day, right? That's what Gordy yeah. did was sub twenty four hours. Um, yeah. Anyway, it is what it is. We're just uh, gonna say of all the buckles, this is the buckle you. I don't hold think on I will throw this one away. How about if I say that about it? Because I have thrown buckles away before. <laughs> I throw medals away. I donate the ones that I can. But like, what are you gonna do with a buckle? Yeah, we um, talked about the whole donating on the classic. Like, tell me you the kept races. the six star. You had to have kept the six, six star. star. Yes, and all okay. medals from all my six stars too, because they're pretty. Although I think the Boston one started rusting or something. Like. No they're not made out of good material uh, yeah if i my thing is if i need a t-shirt or if i need a medal to remember that i did the thing or to remember the experience it must not have been that good of an experience like i will never forget about western states like even if i never run it again even if i never run another mile in my life like it it really was it lived up to the hype not a lot of things live up to the hype in my book but I, western states did that is really good to know. <laughs> I'm glad you had such a great experience with it. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. Yes, and I'm glad you made it in badass. one piece too, like with your hips and everything. So yeah. how you feel in post-race? Uh, today was actually the first day I was able to walk, like not entirely in pain. Like even yesterday I was like down in the DC area walking around and like I had to sit down every 30 minutes or stand up every 30 minutes because I just can't do anything with it. But you know. today is July 7th, by the way, everybody. So it's been a solid two, two weeks since the race. One, one week, one, one week, week. Yeah. Been a solid week. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> It's two weeks from when everyone's listening. He lived an extra <laughs> week in between there. Well, you're amazing. Absolute badass. I could, I, I'll tell you, when we heard your name get pulled for the lottery, like we went nuts. We were like, this is amazing. And now we know how we're going to bring you back. And we're going to talk to you again. Because like the episode when we had you on a long time ago, it was like, oh, you really wanted to get into Western Yeah, States but none of your hosts knew anything about what it was like to run 100 miles. So you had to go get a co-host trained up on how to talk intelligently about yes. 100 miles. Yeah, absolutely, yes. <laughs> and I don't know why Eric didn't volunteer for the assignment, but... <laughs> Still waiting. Th Still waiting. Three yeah. little ones. I think I've done more crew support for her than anybody else, but... I'll give you that. I'm not going to pump my own tires here. Well, that was amazing, and we are also here to talk about Erica. Her race. My turn. I think it is your turn. <laughs> Michaela, thank you, and I hope, do you want to stick around and be my co-host now as we uh, talk to Erica about her 100-miler? Yep. <laughs> her second one, and she went radio silent forever and all that. But Erica, <laughs> all right, I'm going to give you a challenge. Under 30 minutes. Can we do it? <sighs> I'll try my best. Just keep it to the race then. All right. Well, you <laughs> ran in the Yeti. What are we going to call it? The Washington Yeti. What was, give us the details. Tell us about this race. Oh, it was so awesome. Uh, this race took place uh, in Hayek, Washington. Well, that was where the start point is. And it took place on the Palouse to Cascades, uh, like rail to trail system. And it was probably the most gorgeous race I have run to date but it's hard to say that with Big Sur on the list and there's been so many different races but ultra wise this one was absolutely incredible we had some crazy views mountains and you were running over trestles you, we ran through um the Snoqualmie tunnel which was a 2.3 mile long total darkness tunnel which was really cool and like on the other side you had like 
like a little lake and and rivers and waterfalls and it was just totally gorgeous and i understand why you guys like being in the mountains so much <laughs> it was definitely outside of my comfort zone in in the mountain air but it was my type of trail where it was very flat and uh not technical so i had a great time so did you wear road shoes or trail shoes I did trail shoes for this particular race, but I did bring road shoes just in case. Okay. Um, I had heard if it was a rainy day, which that will bring me to one thing. Um, if it was raining, that some of the the rocks out there could get kind of slick and it could be a little a little more technical than usual. Uh, there was rain in the forecast originally. So what we had to do for this, um, you originally had to go, you went from Hayek down to Easton and back, and that was uh, probably 20 something miles. And then you went down, no, 25 miles. Math is not my thing right now, but then you went down through the Snoqualmie (laughs) tunnel down to, uh, God, I can't even, I'm spacing 21 miles down that way and back again. And then you did one more lap of the first one, but they thought it was going to be really cold and rainy. And they were worried about being in that like long stretch alone overnight uh, so they changed the course. So we did the Snoqualmie tunnel, the 21 miles down and back, and then we did three little out and backs and they chopped it a little bit shorter. So you did Hayek to, um, a little bit farther than this aid station called Crystal Springs. You did that three times. So you got to see lots of people at night. You're never really alone. It was, it was nice, but you're just like, oh, wow, I got to do this three times now lab format. So um, I kind of liked how they did that. They changed it just to try to increase the finisher rate. Um, But it turned out to be the most gorgeous day. Started out in like the 40s and then uh, only made it to like 70 degrees. And it wasn't super sunny. It was just absolutely perfect conditions, anything I could have asked for. And even overnight, like it wasn't terrible. I did get really, really cold though. Um, and I just had like a rain jacket with me and that just perked me right back up. I was ready to go put on a pair of gloves and yeah, it helped me help me through the night hours. What were some of like the comparisons? This is your second hundred miler, but it's a Yeti. Was everything mm-hmm. the same Yeti wise or what was the differences being, was it Virginia and now Washington? So Yeti wise, everything was great. Um, you got just super friendly people uh, the volunteers were wonderful. They just wanted to make sure that you were taken care of. Um, the one thing that Yetis like to do, I don't know if it's just how it works out or if it's based on like the trail, but all of the aid stations are about eight miles away from each other. And that it just, it's, it's very slow to tick away when you are moving slowly. So you're just like, Oh my God, I still have this much. Like it's going to take me two more hours to get there. I'm walking so slowly. (laughs) Like that's, but you have your checkpoint, you know, where you're going, you know, you have wonderful people waiting there to take care of you. And you just, it's, it's a piece of the puzzle that you just have to fit in. So, but yeah, it, I liked this one, I think better than Virginia, but I feel like I might get some shit for that. (laughs) I don't know. It was just, it was really nice. It was just easier ish to do because you didn't have like the, the, the harsh grades to go up and by harsh grades, I think we only had like 5% in um, Virginia. So it, it was just nothing, nothing special, but I liked it. It was good. Well, I remember like leading up for chatting and you're out in Washington on like in vacation, oh, drinking. Oh yeah. And touring. <laughs> like, and that was different than yeah. what Michaela was doing. She was flying in super late and uh, just like super focused on all her, her bags and, and everything getting ready for the race. Like, <laughs> So where's your mindset? Like, were you fiddle fucking around with Brandon and like, oh, okay, tomorrow you just have to show up for the race or were you getting prepared at all for this, for this hundred miler? Like I was honestly, I was a little Uh worried. I was like, I don't know if she's in it, if her head game is, is in it right now. Mental preparation is an important part and being relaxed is very important for that. That's all I'm going to say. I took the relaxing thing to a new level, I think. Uh, So we spent time in Seattle and then we went um, to Portland, Oregon for a few days. And then we drove back up. And I think between those, the, like we got in Saturday night and we had to be in Hayek on Thursday and we had visited maybe like 
eight to ten breweries like <laughs> so i had <laughs> i had my fair share of beers i was like not sleeping great I, I definitely could have prepared better that way but i thoroughly enjoyed myself we saw some amazing things i'll have to share some pictures i i know i sent eric some last minute so he couldn't really show everybody no, needed the here, night before eric let's figure this out you didn't let's ask me for them you didn't even ask me today I did, like, and I <laughs> well, I, post I posted some on Facebook. So, but anyways, I had myself a blast. It was my birthday week. So I was living it up. Um, I spent most of my birthday in the car on the way from Portland to Hayek. And that, that was packet pickup day. <laughs> so I, I think I just tried to, I was just trying to keep myself calm. Cause I was freaking out. This was only my second hundred. I, I, I had learned things during the first one. I wanted to do well. I mean, I had everything, like I had a plan and I just needed the day to come. So I was just passing the time however I could. <laughs> what was the this, biggest thing you learned and what was the biggest thing that like you tried to improve on, but you still didn't get right? So the one thing I learned, um, I, I actually learned it from the Western States website was how to tape up my feet. So my feet were the biggest hindrance during my last hundred where I just got sand in there. I had blisters. There was chafing. I had the most uncomfortable feet. So this time I learned how to just prevent the blisters. Um, and I did such a good job on that, pat, patting myself on the shoulders. Um, and I had learned from some people on Instagram. Um, to, and like that's one of the um, Code Brown commandments we have was lube up your toes finally did that and game changer i should have been listening to you guys all along you know what you're doing so i finally did that but the one other thing that could still use improvement is of course my fueling habits because i'll go in there and i'll have like my i like scratch labs um super fuel so that's just calorie drinks easy to get those calories in electrolytes um but at a certain point, you just hit like your sugar threshold and you can't eat any more sugar. So even like the gummy bears that sounded so great at the time and like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I like couldn't even eat that. So I had to kind of pivot and just say like, hey, what's going to work for me? Um, a pickle juice reset, like just a shot of pickle juice, like helped so much. <laughs> um, and then. I did a quick little video on this. One of the aid station volunteers, her name was Michelle, and she was the sister of one of the guys, Jeremy, who I met out there, who was an awesome Yeti, super nice. His whole crew was great. Um, she was making mashed potato quesadillas, and I ate like three of those at one point because I was like, these just taste so amazing right now. And that really, got me mashed through. mashed potatoes. I never thought see, you would like those. See, you put a mashed potato in a thing that I already like, <laughs> and I'm going to eat the shit out of it. So um, that got me through like the first 62 miles. And I was like, I feel fantastic. And at that point, it was starting to get dark. And I would just kind of wanted to go. So like I was trying to finish that first lap. And I think I just kind of depleted myself a little too much. And I didn't put enough calories back in. And then that night lap that I had to do was just kind of miserable because I, your, your stomach just turns on you. So I really couldn't eat. I was trying to take in the calories. Like I was like, all right, just give me some soda. I need something, caffeine, anything. And the night lap that got me to mile like 82, not so great. It was a very, very slow go. Um, but then I had cheese quesadillas at like the aid station back at Hayek. And I was like, all right, I think I can do this last lap. I think I'll be okay. And yeah, just little things you, you got to just try. And I think I tried some potato chips and, but quesadillas seem to, to do the trick, but yeah, it's, that's definitely a learning curve for me is just figuring out what's going to work and, and food will always be, I think the struggle for me, just trying to find out what, what I can eat in that moment and what's going to work. There was no tracking for this race unless no. you're last year why was there no tracking and then you went radio silent on us for a long time you gave us a quick 50 mile update you're like i'm feeling pretty damn good guys yeah mm -hmm. so kind of crushing it and then you went silent <laughs> so yeah this was a different race um i noticed that between registering for the washington yeti and the 
um, Virginia Yeti. The Washington one was like a hundred bucks cheaper. And I kind of assume that's because they didn't have to shell out for tracking like the little chips that you carry around. So um, we did have to manually check in at each aid station. They would just note your time in and out and whatever. And, and off you went. So they just compiled it at the end, I guess. Uh, so I couldn't really have you guys track me at home unless I was doing the social media stuff. And uh, during the first part of the race, that's when you got a majority of my little videos and stuff because I was taking my phone out anyways, like trying to capture the beautiful scenery. And I was like, hey, guys, 30 miles in, feeling great. 42 miles in, woo, let's go. And then 50 miles, it was still daylight. <laughs> You said you were and, crushing it. Yeah. Well, that's because I think I hit like a 50 mile PR. I did it in like 11, 16 or something. And I was like, yeah, hell yeah, I'm doing great. But then it got dark at the end of that lap. I was like, all right, kind of no point in taking my phone out if nobody can see me. And I don't want to talk to myself in the dark. <laughs> so actually I was, I had um, my headphones in. I put on some punk rock and I was like singing to like old follow boy songs and stuff. And that, that helped me through my night lap. But I, at that point I was like, I'm just not going to bother touching the phone because also I had poles and both, <laughs> both hands were occupied. And there was a point where I tried to like, I have the lakey poles and I unclipped one, but I like whacked myself in the face with it. Cause I was trying to like move it and put it under my arm. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to fuck with these anymore. Just going to leave them alone. So yeah, the, the updates kind of stopped. Uh, I did hear all the dings like, where's Erica? Cause I had great service out there, which was kind of weird, but I was like, ah, I'll get, I'll get to you guys when I get to you. The group chat had the memes like Bueller, Bueller, <laughs> you were like, alive. Yep. Saka, you dead. <laughs> I should have told you to call me cause it's easy to just press a button on like my earphone to answer. A phone oh, call good to know it. for next time. Yeah. You'll know. You'll know. Group chat. Instagram live. That's how we'll get to do the social. <laughs> Michaela, it's been a struggle <laughs> to get her to do social media. She said the beginning of 2024, I'll make one post a week. And I think she's made one all year on her I own. Am. Do it. Um, I'm doing races for you, dude. <laughs> yeah, she had some business to attend to when you were bothering the fuck out of her. Uh, and she didn't want to DFFA. No, she didn't want to F whatever. <laughs> Um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna edit that out, Michaela. I don't ever do cut. social media during a race. I rarely do it pre or post race. Yeah, I, I mean, you've seen me on Instagram, right? And I'll be super active for like three days in a row, and then I just go radio silent for the next four months. Um, I think if you give her like some specific targets, you need a smart goal for her. They have to be thematic, right? So like twice a month, she has to post on this theme and this theme, and then yeah, you just have to make her some smart goals for this. <laughs> That's a better oh. chance of me actually doing it. Are so. you a sponsored app? Everybody on Strava? The feed always has like themes, right? Like you have to post about your hydration or what kind of supplements you take or something. So you could follow that. True. We'll keep working on it. We're going to have to write it in a contract. I think that's how we're going to get it. Paid. That's how it's going to happen. Oh, you're giving me stuff? You're paying me? Sure. Now I'll do it. Ah, uh, she's <laughs> only in it for the money, guys. You heard it first. You heard it first. But I'm doing this for free, you guys. So what else? <laughs> we're paying to do this, actually. Yeah. But hey, all right. So the nightfall, the last, the, your first Yeti, there are points where you're like, the cutoff time, you're not going to make it, you thought, and then you messed up mm. the time with your runner's math. Or... I was real worried about that. Yeah, you were. Tell me about that. So during the first Yeti, that's when I was having the foot problems. Like it was mile 48 and I made a shoe change and so much dirt, like mile 48 to 66, just accumulated so much dirt, so much like chafing. The blisters were forming. I was, I was miserable. So I had gotten to like, um, Taylor's Valley aid station, which was maybe like mile 70 something. I just sat down and I was like, I need to do something about these shoes. And I, it just ate up so much of my time and just being tired. It was middle of the night, the darkness, like couldn't comprehend the math. I was, I thought I was going to miss the next cutoff. And then somebody came up behind me and was like, no, you have the, an extra half an hour. And my mind was like, yes, I can actually do this. But, oh yes. Last year. But did yes, that happen that was... this year? Did that happen this time? Nope. Nope. No. This year... Was there any, any like, um, 
someone walking up to you remember last last year and they're like oh when's your next one you're like never never again did you ever have that feeling like i'm two and done no this year was so much better like with all the stuff that i learned um i managed to run so much more of this one like the last one i think i only ran 40 out of the 100 miles i ran at least i would say 70 of these miles like it was an interval so like short little walk breaks but I, I ran a majority of them that right. helped my mindset so much more. And I was like stoked. I was like ready to, to finish the last part of it. I just wanted to, to get going with it. And at that point, um, so we had mentioned the DFFA, <laughs> I saw Amy out on the course, she was pacing somebody. So I got to like, see her a bunch. I got a nice hug. I actually got to meet nice. her boyfriend, Chris, who was a uh, volunteer also, and they just, were awesome out there. <laughs> and, um, I met up with another woman. Uh, we had met up, I think mile, like 30 something. We were just kind of leapfrogging a little bit and she found me again around mile 70 and we finished up the thing together. We were just doing a lot of like, uh, mostly power hiking intervals and it was awesome to have a friend to, to help bring it in, you know, and I didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. You guys. Michaela, do you have anything for Erica here before we go through her photos? As she said, me, we're going to do like rapid fire photos here. Well, when is your next one? What's your next one going to be? Uh, I have one on Friday. <laughs> um, you it's did see that. Yes. <laughs> so I last minute signed up for. Um, it's and you don't just need another ultra. You mean another hundred miler? Yes, but this one, the, the don't judge me just yet. Um, I signed up. <laughs> Full support this. I like it when there are people crazier than I am. Yes. Excellent. So this one is the Notchview Ultra. And for the longest time I was waitlisted and I wasn't sure I was going to get off of the waitlist. So um, this is a, a looped course and you have the option to do either 100.7 miles just based on the, the number of loops um, or you could do a 72 hour. So I have 72 hours to do my 100 miles. <laughs> I have a I have a stronger goal for myself to finish before Saturday night because I want to come home and <laughs> sleep. Um, but I mean, I have all the time I could oh, really want to be do kind that, so. to yourself, Erica. If you're not feeling it, be kind to yourself. I want I you to be able to do hundreds for a lot longer. This and one weeks after is that's that's not a lot of time. Exactly. And this one, um, it's local. I mean, it's only in Massachusetts. So if I have to DNF. I will do so with grace. I am not no, afraid to say that. Get that out no of your mind. That. Yeah, People hopefully they that, don't but... have good swag. Hopefully they have very rough, itchy t-shirts that like you do not want anyway. So if you <laughs> <laughs> But I've heard so many good things about this where I was like, eh, I might as well give it a shot. But we have some friends, like I'm not gonna be alone. Like I'm I'm going alone, but I have a lot of friends who are gonna be there. So it's gonna be I think more of a party atmosphere than it is like a real running event for me. <laughs> Cause I Yeah, not all that seriousness that you took with the last one with only seven or eight breweries. You can really let loose now. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I, I I'm looking forward to it just to to be around friends. We'll we'll call it that. That's the main reason. <laughs> but <Okay>. good <laughs> luck. That, that was next. Thank you. I did so my master, my magic. I got the photos. Yes. Got a little distracted. In no particular order, we're going to go through all your photos here. That sure. You Let's start with this one. So that with there, that is the opening of the Snoqualmie Tunnel. And it is endless. <laughs> you cannot see. There's no lights inside whatsoever. It's just dark void. And really? that was, yep, like how, that was. How long is it? It's 2.3 miles long. In a dark tunnel and you can't see in front of you. Well, you have to bring, we had to bring our own like headlamps and stuff, but I was showing this to Brandon the day after. And I was like, see, this happened like 0.4 miles into my race. <laughs> so it's just this was, and it's this started straight, it off. the entire way straight. Pretty much. I mean, I didn't notice uh, too much of a, of a curve, I guess. I, it, I mean, you can't see What's anything. What's this used <laughs> for? Like, it looks like a single walking Tunnel. It used There's to be no for train. trains. It used okay. to be. So All yeah, right. inside it's, um, it's basically flat. Um, it does have some divots cause there is some water that can get in there. So there's like drips and some holes <laughs> from, Was it from just water or scary or any of that. It's creepy. And yeah. it's so weird. It, it echoes, like it gets all your footsteps. You think you're hearing stuff like, and then you can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
but it just never gets closer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's such a trippy thing. It was it was kind of crazy. All right. Is this the start line? I'm, I'm going to guess. So this is the Hayek like, point. That's the Yeti arch behind me. But this is me 42 miles into it. So I had done the Snoqualmie part. And I'm ready to set off for my first lap of um, out okay. to Crystal Springs. So that's, yeah, I did a, an outfit change. But you see my skirt there. Um, that's my rainbow unicorn skirt and it's kind of my lucky skirt now it's it gotten me two two buckles um <laughs> and um there's a runner on the course christy her daughter was obsessed with unicorns so she kept calling me a thousand unicorns like she nice. cheered for me whenever she saw me so um what's on your socks also unicorns and rainbows okay. that's a <laughs> I, i'm embracing unicorn. huh it's a fat unicorn well yeah fat calves so <laughs> swollen calves Strong, strong calves. There we go. Now this is Jason Green, right? Yes, yes. He's the race director for Jason all of the Eddie racers. Name. He's amazing. He gives hugs to every one of his finishers. And I didn't cry this time. I, I bawled my eyes out during my first hundred because I was just so emotional, so in pain. And this went a lot better. So all right. Is this the same tunnel or a different tunnel? This is the same tunnel, but from the opposite side. I'm about to go through it the second time um, to head back to Hayek. And those okay. two gentlemen in front of me are Travis and Andrew. And I met up with them a few miles before this. Um, they asked if they could go through the tunnel with me because they forgot to grab their headlamps again. So they didn't have lights. <laughs> so we had been leapfrogging here and there. And um, yeah, they, they wound up doing a whole bunch of miles with me. So they were nice. super cool. This, now this photo looks fun. Yes. So the one holding the camera, that's Christy. She, she's the one who calls me a thousand unicorns. And then Jeremy's, um, his AKA Chad ultra persona is super fun, but he, uh, he was great. He, he introduced me to all of these awesome people. And then the gentleman on the right is Reggie and apparently he's super unprepared for races, but he just has the most infectious like attitude ever. He's just so pumped to be there so happy that you're there he's he just cheers you on as you go he's so so awesome so those were three people who just turned this race around for me made it super fun and i appreciate them so much so wait that's chad in the middle yep that's chad his, his real name's Jeremy. Chad, chad is our newest patreon thank you chad how wonderful is he he's fantastic we'll give him his his patreon <laughs> dues and the next uh -huh. time, the next time we do the real pros in a yep. couple weeks but Thank you. Yeah. If anyone wants to jump on that Patreon page like Chad there, <laughs> go for it. I would love to have you be a friend or a lover of the pipes. This is the honey bucket. You sent <laughs> us this photo, maybe the first photo you ever sent us. Uh -huh. What a spot for order potty, but they screwed up. There should be no door and they should turn it around. Unless <laughs> is the view just as epic on the other side. No, I think there was like a rock wall, <laughs> but I, I sent this to, to uh, the group chat saying like pooping with a view because it was absolutely gorgeous, like the mountain behind it. I mean, there's you could see that strip of cloud, so it's trying to peek up above yeah. the clouds yeah. and it was just so gorgeous. Oh, we got a video here. Oh, this is me showing you the... There, oh, there's yeah. a porta potty. Yeah, there's <laughs> or, a porta potty. I, I think that actually might be a different one, but yeah, the views how, were how just How were incredible. the porta potties? spectacular so really? clean mm -hmm. oh and nice. the, there were there were bathrooms at the the main aid station in hayek um with running water showers and flushing toilets so okay wow yeah, the, that the one there was again. a Where the start here? line oh this was one of the trestles that we were crossing it was over like a huge valley and i just wicked liked it <laughs> Actually, Beautiful. I think there's a photo we'll have to find out on your Strava of a big mm -hmm. bridge because I don't think you sent it to me here. Yeah, yeah it was hard. It was hard to. <laughs> they were, but it was really hard to find like the good pictures, like just out of the blue. But this oh, was man, on the second half of the course, right before it started getting dark. It was just so yeah. so. Pretty. I saw that face, Michaela. That was the O face. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, doesn't that just make you so happy? Like, you know, and you were probably like in a little bit in a pain cave, even if it was early on in the race. But you know, yeah. it looked. Like going into evening and you're like oh my god this sucks i'm so dumb for doing this why are people tortured and then you look up and you're like i've never seen that color combination before in my life how, can that <laughs> exist? how is it that i'm so lucky to exist on this planet yeah. and then yeah you realize you've gone like 10 feet and you still have a whole bunch more miles to <laughs> yeah there were a lot of good stuff um 
so this was not race related, but we had taken a, a little hike um, because the mountain was out. Mount Rainier was out in yep. its full glory. So we, we got to see it and it is a spectacular mountain. Uh, I am going to now move it to Strava. <laughs> now it's my turn for him to <laughs> creep on the Strava. Here's so the let Strava me just photos. tell you while so, I was... So we saw this with Jason Green earlier. Yes. So while I was out here contemplating my life and how terrible I heard at times and and stuff, I was just thinking about Michaela and how much harder she had it with all of her climbs. And, yeah. and I was just like, damn, damn, she's so awesome. But it did you help be me. Honest, because... you, were, you knew Michaela was going to crush it. And you're like, I, I want did. to celebrate on the pod together and not have a DNF. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't want a DNF anyways. I, I was pretty confident in my performance that I wasn't going to. And I had total confidence in yours, Michaela. I just knew you were going to smash that. So everything was just right with the world. Yeah. This photo is sick. Cool I love this is? photo. Yeah, dude. Except for that hand right there. You can edit that out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do that. magic eraser later. I didn't even notice yeah. it. <laughs> Oh, this is cool. Amazing, Erica. So the Strava stats yeah. real quick. How the heck did your watch get so close to 100.01 miles? Okay. For the record, my watch, this is the closest it's been. When I crossed the finish line, I was at 99.7 miles. So I oh, had to I'm go reading little... the description. <laughs> yeah, dude. I had to go over because I wanted the Garmin badge that had like a hundred miles in one in one go so i just said all right i could hobble around for a couple and do a little extra but my my first yeti my watch was so off i had messed with the gps because i wanted longer battery li battery life and i think i ended up with 95 miles and i was like i had no idea where i was on the course everything was screwy this was the closest i've come to actually hitting it so i was very excited <laughs> but yeah yeah 2100 feet in elevation Hey, I did more than that in Milt Washington. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, this was really wasn't bad. That was 7.6 miles. <laughs> so the, the, the pass down to Snoqualmie, like um, through the tunnel and that stretch of it, um, on the way back, there was like a slight incline. And you, you barely felt it. You knew it was there, but whatever. That was the majority of the climbing. Well, I don't care. Bad. You're still a badass, just like Michaela. Congratulations. The second. Oh, I think. I think we got very delete here. Mm -hmm. It's a PR. Yes. See, I told you. I learned things. I did better. I, I did an official time of 2745, which is just like it was very close to being two hours faster. I think it was like an hour and 45 minutes faster. So, You're a badass. You're and both badasses. I got mine. There it is. Ooh. This is like gold and um, silver, just the way that they did it's pretty cool mm -hmm. you're amazing you great job see? both you That's ladies where the unicorns go. i will do it one day but probably not until my 50s i would love to do it sooner but guys kids kids remember <laughs> the adorable little ones you said i had there michaela they're so cute and adorable yes and they're probably destroying the downstairs right now again why did i plan this on a sunday at seven i don't know i don't know but <laughs> i don't know either dude it's a lot of fun michaela's in Listen, the dark now <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, I could try to find a light. My voice is holding up a little bit, I think. I think I'm doing okay. So, mm -hmm. well, this is great. Anything else we want to catch up on real quick? Let's, let's, about the race, anything you want to add that we didn't? I know we kind of, we kind of, you know, ran through yours really quickly, Erica. This wasn't the epic first ever 100 miler. And we'll have more later this year to talk about. I really wanted to focus on Michaela in Western well, States. I wanted to focus on Michaela. That's that's the real stuff, the the cool shit to talk about. So, I mean, I think we touched upon everything. I I was really happy with what I learned from the first one. I brought it into the second one. Gators, let me tell you. Did he fiddle fuck wanted... around at any aid stations with Brandon, or did you learn from the last one? Um, I mean, I did a little bit. It wasn't terrible, but um, it was mostly because I needed to change, and so it was not a lot of unnecessary time like I did you have to, a pacer I to stop. or just crew just crew yeah okay. he, he so we were staying five minutes like less than five minutes away from the place like you the the house was adjacent to the trail but you just couldn't get to it because there was like a thick 
foliage. <laughs> so he just had to drive around and I would, I would give him a call and say, Hey, I'll, I'll be here in half an hour. Can you, can you meet me? And so he would just drive. He had my pack in the, in the car and, and I would change and do whatever I had to do. So it was, it was really nice that he could go off and do whatever he needed to do and didn't have to wait for me. And yeah, it was, it was easier. And I mean, I really, I really enjoyed it. You guys <laughs> never thought I'd say that. And by the time this drops, you would have have already attempted another hundred miler. Crazy! I like how you said attempted because we don't know how that one's going to go. I yet. know, I know. <laughs> but this is awesome. Final question for Michaela. This is unrelated to the altar. So thank you both for sharing the stories. But Michaela, if you remember last year when you were on the pod, or was that two? That was two years ago. We had the question, the Spotify song you picked, "Raining Tacos," and then I would. I would like creep through Instagram and, and ask for a story if you had a photo. And I got the photo of your underwear. Remember that one? The <laughs> photo of your yeah, underwear. I remember yeah. That. Long day underwear, you know, speed work. <laughs> I changed up my question. I no longer go creeping. Maybe I creep through some people's profiles, but I'm going to change mine every year. This year, I am building a list of Code Brown commandments. And a Code Brown commandment, I'm putting you on the spot here, it can be any kind of advice to avoid an oh crap moment. Code Browns, as you know, could be not l legit. Like it could be shitting yourself in a race. I use the example to, to break tape, which was yours. You broke tape to win that $300 to get that treadmill. But it's any oh crap moment, like running into a bear on the course or chafing. Like, so my favorite Code Brown credit is mine is diaper rash cream cures chafing overnight. And people give us code brown creators like don't trust a fart. And they might actually give us good ones like leave no trace or running advice for all birds. So with all your running experience, can you give us a code brown commandment, which is really just advice to avoid the oh shit or the oh crap moments? Or it could be advice to avoid an actual legit code brown. Put you on the spot, but I want you to be part of this list, the code brown commandments. Yeah, well, most of the ones you already mentioned are things that I do, like the baby Boudreaux's butt pace. That's, you know, a good one. The lubing of the toes is always a good thing. Lubing of the butt cheeks is always a good one. I have these really nice silicone wipes that I use as my, like, toilet paper mid-race because whatever's coming out of there is not a thing that should be stuck around. It should be coated in silicone and just, yeah. Um, I'm rambling here because I haven't come up with a good one yet. That's why I'm still rambling. I will say there was a giant pile of human excrement on the middle of the Western States Trail. And this was a point of the course where almost everybody had a pacer with them. Um, so I was very upset that, and I mean, it was like a terrible portion of the trail where like there's a hill on this side and there's a hill on this side. But, like, somebody could have just shoot it off. And judging by the form and consistency and shape, like, it wasn't an emergency, right? Oh. Like, it wasn't a puddle. Like, it could have been done other places. Anyway, so the new, the leave no trace one is a good one. Um, I think I'm going to stick with, like, what we were talking about earlier. It's like, I didn't even pay attention to porta potties. So you should be comfortable going almost anywhere at any time and, uh, just like knowing how to take care of yourself in the woods efficiently, I think is an important part of doing ultras. One of my first ever ultras, this girl like had never peed outside before. And she's like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. How do I do this? Like, where, where do I sit? <laughs> so yeah, I think being comfortable squatting anywhere, everywhere, uh, and being able to get yourself back up from that squat at mile 85 is also important. <laughs> Thou shall be comfortable squatting anywhere at any time. Yes. Love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much. This was a blast, guys. I hope you enjoyed us today coming back during our little summer break. We'll be gone for another week or so, but we will have a real episode with another amazing guest next week that went long. So we're dropping just for our episode. It's going to be a blast. And then around the end of July, we'll be back from the Tros. So you guys rock. Good luck in whatever is next. I love you. Don't fear the code Brown and Erica. Take us home. Thanks for sticking with us. I hope you're having a great summer. And don't forget to stretch. <laughs>